with you in Maui. I've been trying to figure out since the first of the year whether I was dead or not because I seem to be living in heaven. I just go from one uh, wonderful scene to the next. I was in Portugal the first two weeks of January doing a science fiction film. Flew from there to the revolt in Chiapas, home to do the mail, and then back to my home on the nearby larger and more volcanically active island to the east. And now I'm here with you this evening. Thanks to Robin Johnson and Gary who did the wonderful introduction, pleasant in its brevity. <clears throat> and I'm here to talk to you this evening about speaking about the unspeakable, which seemed to leave uh, the field fairly broadly open for the last minute uh, adjustments. Speaking about the unspeakable, it's both a joke and uh, a pointer toward a very serious uh, set of subjects. First of all, the unspeakable is that which lies uh, beyond the domain of language. And when I titled the lecture, I was thinking of Wittgenstein, who mentioned the unspeakable, the things which exceed our grasp. The other meaning of the unspeakable is the things we'd rather not speak about, our dilemma, our history, and how hard it will be to create solutions to our dilemma. So I thought with those two um, understandings of the meaning of the unspeakable in place, I would launch myself into a kind of uh, meandering diatribe which will go on for a while and then we'll take a break and then we'll entertain questions from the floor so that's the basic uh, that's the formula I'm sure it's no news here that we are approaching uh, the third millennium that a thousand years of Christian civilization is uh, percolating to its end, that we are on the brink of some kind of turning in the cosmic machinery. And though historians think of history as an endlessly fluctuating and trendlessly fluctuating process, in fact, I think for anyone with half an eye, it's clear that history is some kind of uh, self-consuming process that occurs in geological and biological time in a kind of instant. It is not something that can be built into the life of a planet for endless eons. It's a phase transition and it has the character of creating ever-expanding uh, adaptive effectiveness for the species that practices it, usually through technology. But this adaptive effectiveness ultimately becomes uh, toxic, no longer serves the endless expansion of population, the endless subduing <clears throat> of nature becomes counterproductive. And at that point, the feedback signals from the process of global civilization become signals indicating danger and time to shift to another gear, time to change the paradigm by which the society has directed itself. And Western civilization, through technological success, has become the dominant global civilization. So unlike the rise and fall of the Maya, which occurred in a kind of cultural and historical vacuum, our civilization touches everyone 
on this planet. We're involved in a species-wide crisis, and it's a crisis of adaptation and intelligence. If we can meet the crisis, if we can redesign the cultural machinery so that it can glide in to the new value system that a limited Earth and an electronically activated population demand, then we can use the crisis as a stepping stone to further exploration of the universe, further evolution, further unfoldment. If we can't meet the challenge, then the fossil record makes clear that there is a place and a plan for those who can't cut the mustard. 95% <laughs> of all species that have ever lived on this planet are extinct. Nature is an engine for the production of extinct species. And if we are to evade that fate, then we have to rise to the challenge that our history deposits in our laps because we have been practicing maladaptive technologies, maladaptive ideologies for about 12,000 years now. Well, this is not news to anybody. This just sets the stage. <clears throat> My perspective on this is a little different from uh, many futurists or planners or people who grapple with this because I believe that the answer to this dilemma and the answer to uh, the contradictions that history confronts us with is a deeper exploration of the psychedelic experience and the psychedelic experience is something incredibly alien to the, to the Western mind. It is in fact taboo. It is in fact one of these unspeakable subjects promised in the lecture title. It's possible to go from birth to the grave without ever having a psychedelic experience. It's not built into your biology the way orgasm or uh, sleep or hunger or something like that is. It's a physiological option that involves forming a symbiotic relationship with a plant or post high technology with a substance either derived from a plant or probably structurally related to substances within plants. Consciousness appears to be on one level a materialistic phenomenon in that it springs from uh, the physical brain. It springs from the electrochemical processes that go on within organism. <clears throat> on another level, consciousness and the psychedelic experience seem to be a kind of angelic descent into the domain of matter, a kind of iridescence from another dimension that infuses materiality. This is a great uh, paradox, and it's a paradox that persists right down to the molecular level. Uh, psychopharmacologists know, for example, that by shifting a single atom on the ring structure of a chemically active molecule, it can be changed from being extremely psychoactive to being completely inert. Now, if this is not a proof that consciousness springs from the quantum mechanical level, I don't know what would be. So, what that means then, to me, is that matter itself has what Alfred North White had called an appetition for completion. Everything in the universe strives to transcend itself. Everything in the universe has what White had called an internal horizon of transcendence. 
And in the human organism, this internal transcendent horizon within historical times has been frustrated by ideologies, has been channeled in negative directions towards such phenomenon, uh, such phenomena as urbanism, male kingship, uh, monocultural agriculture, phonetic alphabets, so forth and so on. These cultural institutions, one by one, are the bricks that we have used to build ourselves into an impossible prison. Now, <clears throat> into this situation, about a hundred years ago, comes the news that there are Aboriginal people in various parts of the earth who are using plants to journey into invisible dimensions where divination, curing, and apparent violations of natural law are possible. You'll recall that in, I think it was 1888, Louis Lewin, the German pharmacologist, went to, of all places, uh, Cincinnati <laughs> and scored 120 pounds of peyote, which he dutifully took back to Berlin and set to work upon and quickly isolated the active principle, or it was isolated by a colleague of his, that initiated the modern era of psychopharmacology. And quickly, um, harmaline in the 20s, LSD in the 40s, psilocybin and DMT in the 50s, and then more exotic compounds were discovered. But as quickly as they were discovered, they were made illegal and they were professionally stigmatized so that scientific careers uh, were ruined if people chose to involve themselves in these substances. Well now here's an interesting paradox. Science, which uh, claims a kind of universal objectivity, which claims a kind of God-given right to probe into all dimensions and domains of nature actually grew very queasy at the possibility of chemical agents being used to study and elucidate consciousness. And I think that when we analyze <clears throat> this modern institutional reluctance to deal with these compounds, what we uncover is in fact the lost history of the human race and the secret of our transcendent nature, our uh, difference from the rest of animal nature is linked to the psychedelic compounds and so is our sexuality and so is our peculiar adaptive intelligence. This is the situation, you see, that we are half angels, half animals, half in the dimension of the rest of nature and half in a dimension which can barely be described, the dimension of globe-girdling information transfer networks high technology, the elucidation of the inner structure of stars and atoms, a world created by mind, a world created by the operation of abstraction. And this is the great thing which we do. We take data and matter and we elaborate these things into constructs, either physical artifacts, machines, art galleries, cities, or ideological constructs, Marxism, feminism, Catholicism, Zoroastrianism. We seem to be the creature that can download 
the ideas, the platonic perfect forms of a higher dimension into the world of matter. And so where we are, there is an interfacing between the world of ordinary nature and some kind of transcendent force. And I really believe that history is the trail in the snow, if you will, of this journey toward a fusion of spirit and matter that the alchemical dream of the 16th century, which was the fusion of spirit and matter, was naively believed to be something that a single individual could achieve working alone in some Bavarian laboratory. This is not what it is, I think. I think human history is the alchemical process. The human organism is the prima materia, and our dreams are the goals that guide this process. And we have pursued this path for so long that there now is no going back. The only possibility now is a, what I call a forward escape. That means where you just put the pedal to the floor and close your eyes and go for it. Because there's no going back. And my interest in psychedelics arises from two sources. Number one, the clear evidence available to everyone that societies that use psychedelics practice a kind of dynamic equilibrium with the earth and with the environment. They are stable. That's one factor arguing for the psychedelic experience. The other factor, a much more personal factor, is that it's the only thing I've ever seen which would turn people around as fast as we have to turn around if we're to avoid the fatal momentum of our past mistakes. Because we inherit essentially a runaway freight train on a downhill slope. And, you know, they take and place us in the driver's seat and say, do something about human history. Well, no society can evolve faster than it can change its mind and its language. So, speaking about the unspeakable means stretching the envelope of what can be said. When new things can be said, new plans can be laid, new directions can be found out of a crisis. And science has steered us deeply into the notion that nature is soulless and spiritless. And the practice of this idea has led us to the brink of catastrophe, global and species and ecological catastrophe. Meanwhile, these aboriginal societies have been journeying freely to and from the spirit realm through the use of plants for as many millennia as we have been wandering in the deserts of abstraction. Now, these two halves of the human family have to make common cause because the rainforest shaman and the Manhattan stockbroker are essentially in the same lifeboat with the same set of problems, a dissolving atmosphere, toxic oceans, overpopulation, commercialization of violence, uh, sexism, racism, you name it. These problems are global problems. And they are problems that will not be solved without an incredible leap of imagination. Psychedelics are catalysts for the human imagination. That very simply is what they are. Uh, it doesn't say they're good, 
It doesn't say they are bad. They will catalyze the perverse imagination with the same effectiveness that they will catalyze the Gaian responsible imagination. Nevertheless, if we do not avail ourselves of these tools, I think the, the, uh, the cultural enterprise is in quicksand and sinking quickly or a kind of sinking submarine. So how can we change our minds, redesign our value systems, redesign our languages quickly enough to avert some kind of global degradation of the quality of life that will leave our children the poorer Well, the way to do this, I think, is to get connected up with the rest of nature. Nature is a seamless community of intentionality. Nature is a gene swarm covering the surface of the planet. Biological nature, I'm talking here, is a set of interlocking strategies and intents, the sole purpose of which is to one, survive, and to two, maintain creative openness so that there can be further evolutionary advance. All life participates in the multiple feedback loops that homeostatically regulate this thing called nature. Only human beings, under the aegis of our peculiar civilization, have been able to sufficiently insulate themselves through urbanization, through the clearing of land, through special vocabularies, have been able to sufficiently insulate themselves to escape the implication of this natural engine of balance and equilibrium. The way back then is to get this Gaian connection. And if hortatory preaching could do it, the, turn, the Sermon on the Mount would have been the turning point. But clearly that's not the case. Some things have gotten considerably worse since the Sermon on the Mount, for my money. The only way back is through a direct experience of the sacral and unitary nature of being. This is a very difficult problem for us because experience is something that we have given away. We are consumers of experience handed down through a hierarchy that begins somewhere near Madison Avenue, a hierarchy of image production that causes all our values to be brought in from the outside as religions, as product fetishism, brand loyalty, ideologies. We consume these things the same way we consume petroleum and rice. What we have to do is begin to concentrate on the felt presence of immediate experience. This is what Western civilization has lost, is a sense of the felt presence of immediate experience. In other words, we have to live in the body. Ideology must serve feeling. Technology must serve intuition. What we're talking about here is a complete inversion of social values. We're talking about a feminizing of culture, a greening of culture, and a de-emphasis on mechanism and a de-emphasis on uh, goals, the achievement of goals over the style with which these goals are achieved. One of the books that I wrote 
was called the Archaic Revival. And I called it that because I can discern, or I delude myself into thinking I can discern, throughout the 20th century, a very large cultural pattern, which is what I call the nostalgia for the archaic. It is, it touches phenomena as diverse as Freudian and Jungian psychoanalysis, jazz, body piercing, rock and roll, uh, new age therapy, uh, scarification and tattoos, house music, what all these things have, abstract expressionism, surrealism, dada, what all these things have in common is a reverence for the irrational and the experiential, the tempos of the body. We are in the 20th century at last beginning to at least debate the possibility of setting off from Aristotelianism and the world of the Edwardian gentleman. And it's about time, I would say, it's the last possible moment before we will have any choice in the matter. And what I left off that list was uh, shamanism and psychedelic plants. Because when you begin to think about archaic life, about what it really meant, the shaman emerges as the paradigmatic figure. The shaman cures, the shaman travels in invisible dimensions, the shaman can rescue souls, the shaman can somehow violate ordinary space and time. And at the center of shamanism is the psychedelic experience. Now there's a lot of haggling about this in anthropology, but just to let you know where I'm coming from, I believe shamanism without psychedelics is shamanism on its way to becoming religion. Not all shamanisms in the world are psychedelic. Some rely on uh, ordeal, some rely on quote-unquote abnormal personalities. Uh, these are forms of shamanism that are drifting toward institutional religion. Shamanism is not, strangely enough, the product of cultural values alone. It's uh, a series of ideas that have been built up around an experience an experience which most people in our society have never had. It's the experience of boundary dissolution, of the collectivity of planetary life, of the presence of strange and alien dimensions filled with intelligence and intent toward humanity. It is, in short, the world of pagan natural magic. And this is the world that beckons in the light of the failure of the cultural models of the last couple of thousand years. Now, it's a matter of great political controversy. Somehow, the changing of consciousness is deemed to be uh, threatening to the state. Now, why is that? Is the state somehow playing a shell game that would be exposed if people were to actually open their eyes? In what way does the expansion of consciousness threaten uh, industrial democracies? I think we need real answers to this. We like to believe we're a free society, but in fact, uh, this, is a, this is a game of puppet and puppeteer no different from the game that was played inside the Marxist societies so recently deceased. It is irrational for people to addict themselves to the consumption of products, to money fetishism, and to linear ideologies. All of this is irrational, but it's practiced with a vengeance inside the high-tech industrial democracies. 
I maintain that we have drifted very, very far from a viable social system and that in order to return to a viable social system, we're going to have to revivify our archaic styles. This is going on all around us throughout the 20th century, as I said, in an unconscious fashion. But I'm suggesting that we do it in a conscious fashion and that we admit that hegemony, monotheism, uh, print-created culture, obsession with stuff, that all of these things have played us false. They do not satisfy. And what satisfies is authentic experience. And authentic experience has been made almost impossible inside the world of media manipulated symbols and manufactured ideologies that constitutes the modern world. So what's required then is a radical act of disassociation from these value systems. And what that means is boundary dissolving psychedelic intoxication. <laughs> allowing the Gaian agenda to manifest itself by dissolving the ego and by standing outside the structures of consumerist society. When this is done by large numbers of people, and I think the fact that we're here this evening means uh, that the agenda is proceeding on time, under budget. When this is done, people will not tolerate the kind of human societies and the kind of uh, allocation of resources that we're witnessing today. Uh, the, the obscenity of great wealth in the presence of great poverty, the obscenity of further destruction of the earth in the presence of spreading deserts and cities, uh, the obscenity of the destruction of our educational system with the knowledge that our children require education more than anything else. All of these um, failures of will can be overcome if we can connect to our feelings. Because what we are is a person sitting in the corner of a room hitting themselves repeatedly on the head with a hammer. If we could feel what we were doing, we would stop instantly. <laughs> but we cannot feel what we're doing. We have ideologies, we have excuses, we have government spokesmen, committees, commissions, study groups, white papers, so forth and so on. It's perfectly obvious that Western civilization has shot its wad. It's perfectly obvious that Christianity has produced a nightmare of repression, of anti-human intolerance. It's perfectly obvious that the nuclear family is a cauldron for the production of neurosis and the employment of psychotherapists. <laughs> it's perfectly obvious that uh, the most destructive drugs we have discovered are peddled freely in every shopping center. It's perfectly obvious that the drugs of transcendence that connect us up to the earth are the drugs that are uh, those who govern us are most interested in repressing. We are living inside an impossible set of contradictions, no less impossible than the set of contradictions the people of the Soviet Union were asked to live under until very recently. How long can we tolerate business as usual? How long can people who drive Mercedes and send checks to Greenpeace twice a year content themselves with the idea that that is a sufficient response to a burning and dying planet? What we have to do, I think, is radicalize our point of view. And what that means is, first of all, a telescoping back, a telescoping back, most people can't tell whether Joseph Goebbels served in the first or second Nixon administration. <laughs> Most people have no sense of history at all. But when you, and this is a failure of education, plain and simple, but when you pull back 10,000 years, 100,000 years, 
a million years, a hundred million years, a billion years, then something emerges that is not taught in the schools, that is not recognized by science, that is never discussed and never mentioned. And that is that the further back in time you go, the simpler the universe becomes until finally you reach the extraordinary improbability of the Big Bang. This is a moment where the universe for no reason sprang from nothingness according to science. Now notice that whatever you think about that hypothesis, it's the limit test for credulity. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if you believe that, you can believe anything. That is the most unlikely proposition the human brain can generate. And yet science holds its forth as axiom one. Axiom one, the universe sprang from nothing for no reason. Well, from that moment on, the universe has been complexifying itself as it cooled. First, it's a, it's a plasma of pure electrons. Then, as it cools, atoms form. Uh, electrons can settle into to stable orbits around atomic nuclei. As atomic systems aggregate into stars, fusion occurs. Heavier elements are cooked out, among them carbon. Four valent carbon allows a new world of complexity to emerge, the world of uh, organic chemistry. Out of that possibility emerge long chain polymers. Out of that possibility emerge self replicating molecular systems, and out of that comes primitive life, and out of that, complex life, and out of that, land-based life, and out of that mammals, and out of that primates, and out of that human beings sitting around the campfire, chewing on reindeer hides and chipping flint, and out of that our own immensely complex, planet-girdling, planet-agonizing civilization. Okay, but now notice something about this um, um, Notice something about this set of declensions that I just ran through. It's that each advance into complexity occurs more quickly than the process which preceded it. So that, you know, it took a long, long time for stars to aggregate. And then it took a long, long time for life to appear. Once life appears, the cosmic machine quickens its pace. Once the conquest of the land appears, it turns another turn of the spiral and quickens its pace. Once you arrive at human beings, you arrive in the domain of very rapid processes, even from the point of view of biology. Uh, you know, some people have a great enthusiasm for believing that there were high civilizations 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago on the earth. I don't buy into that at all. I think the miracle of the human adventure is how new everything is. There are uh, people teaching in respectable universities who believe language is 35,000 years old. I mean, try to wrap your mind around that. That means it's, it's as artificial a thing as the electric toothbrush language we're talking about here. Uh, we are apparently the cutting edge of an ever-accelerating, concrescent process. And this is what I was referring to at the beginning of the talk when I said history cannot go on forever. History represents a phase in the development of something. And the conquest of the land represented an earlier phase in the development of that same thing. The long, the hundreds of millions of years of life in the ocean, yet a longer, earlier phase of this same process of emergence. Now, the pace of the cosmic drama has quickened. 
it rests in us. In the last hundred years, there has been more scientific and cultural advance, let's make that scientific advance, <laughs> than in the previous hundred thousand years. This acceleration leads any rational person to the conclusion that eventually we are going to enter into domains of novelty of such short duration that they will consume history. And I believe that this is what the psychedelic experience actually reveals, that uh, you, know, you can talk about the Jungian unconscious, you can talk about the maps of the Witoto or the Warane, but that the really the most effective map of the psychedelic domain is, strange to say, a mathematical map. That consciousness is the conquest of dimensionality. Biology is the conquest of dimensionality. The evolution of organs of locomotion and coordinated eyesight and so forth, these are uh, devices to propel us through three-dimensional space. The mind in its ability to coordinate data and anticipate situations is a kind of transtemporal organ. It is coordinating us in time as well as space. We are growing toward a kind of hyperspatiality. And this is a drama of universal import because it is all biology that participates in this. Now this represents a radical change of view to what the myth of our civilization is. The myth of our civilization is that the universe began a long time ago. It will be consumed in entropic heat death a long, long time in the future. We are on an ordinary planet around an ordinary star, in an ordinary galaxy, in a universe of hundreds of millions of such galaxies. In other words, it's put down, put down, put down, put down. A minimalizing of our importance. We are no more, in the view of science, than fortunate spectators to a cosmic drama that knows and cares nothing about us. I don't believe this. I don't think the evidence of the psychedelic experience supports it. I think that the universe is an engine for the production of novelty, ever quicker, ever faster, ever denser, and that at this moment, so far as we know, so far as we know, in this universe, we, the human species, our civilization, this evening, right now, is the most complex organization, system, organism in existence. Therefore, somehow, the fate of the cosmic intent rests with us. We are not without responsibility in this situation. Somehow, the next step, the next advancement into novelty depends on our um, being a smooth and doubtful conduit for its emergence. And so, as a global civilization, we can no longer afford the luxury of an unconscious <laughs> mind. I mean, when you can pull down the fusion processes that light the stars, when you can pull that down on the cities of your enemies, when you can uh, sequence the DNA, when you can map the heart of the atom, then it is entirely inappropriate to have an unconscious mind because the power that is given unto you is a kind of godlike Promethean power. So how can we switch on the lights on our animal nature and draw ourselves toward the angelic destiny that wants to happen? Well, I think it's very simple. We have to decondition ourselves from culture. We are sick. We require medical <laughs> intervention, immediate medical intervention to uh, 
attempt to intervene on what is a galloping, cancerous state of neurosis, the growth and spread of ego. Ego is like a calcareous growth in the psyche of human beings. And if it is not treated, it creates the kind of society that we have. A society based on hierarchy, male dominance, accumulation of physical goods, suppression of the weak by the strong. This is the kind of society that is created when those values are pushed. This is why the psychedelics are so socially sensitive because they dissolve deconditioning. And every culture is a, is a scam. Every culture is a lie, a shell game run by weasels for the amusement of rubes. And if you don't want to be a weasel or a rube, then you need to inform yourself of how the shell game works and what lies beyond the carnival midway of civilized values. And the way to do that is to go back to the plants, to go back to the original gnosis. Because it, it isn't simply that there is some magic in perturbing the chemistry of the brain with psychedelics. Why should that uh, confer wisdom or insight or anything else? It only can do that if beyond the deconditioning there is a wholeness waiting. There is a mystery to be revealed. And I think it's the mystery of the guy in mind. History is what happens to you when you lose touch with the guy in mind, with the feminine, nurturing, planetary matrix that is the atmosphere and the ocean currents and the biota of the earth. Well, how could we have fallen so far? How could we have gotten into a mess like this? I spent a lot of time thinking about this. Man's fall, what is it? Is it real? Are we still a pristine expression of the will and beauty of nature? Or have we somehow sullied ourselves, somehow fallen from the track? And trying to think as a biologist, an evolutionary thinker, so forth and so on, here's my conclusion based on uh, a lifetime of thinking about this, traveling around, getting loaded, reading, dealing with the data. All primates and we are primates. All primates have what are called dominance hierarchies. This means the long-fanged, hard-bodied young males kick everybody around. Mm -hmm. The females, the youngs, the juveniles, the homosexuals, everybody takes their marching order from the male dominators. And we, as we sit here in this room, are deeply and terribly afflicted with these attitudes. But I maintain this has not always been the case, and our peculiar position in nature has to do with a kind of evolutionary accident. Here's what it is, and as I go through it, I hope you understand it's an effort to solve one of the great problems of evolutionary biology, which is, why was it that within a period of time no more than two and a half million years, the human brain size doubled. Uh, Lumholtz, who is an evolutionary biologist of the academic mold, calls the evolution of the human brain the most explosive transformation of a major organ of a higher animal in the entire fossil record. Well, now, this is a great embarrassment for evolutionary theory because notice this is the organ which created the theory of evolution in the first place. So for it to be inexplicable within the terms of that theory is a little alarming to those who have a big stake in all of this. I maintain that by analyzing objectively what psychedelics do to us, we can understand not only our origins, but our predicament. And here's the scenario. 
Like all animal species, we reached a kind of evolutionary climax in the canopies of the rainforests of tropical Africa five to six million years ago, our ancestors. Fruititarian, insect-eating, complex pack signaling as an antecedent to language, and there we rested. Except that the dynamics of the planet dictated that those rainforests would shrink in size and be replaced by grasslands, and we came under nutritional pressure. When an animal comes under nutritional pressure, it has two choices. It can starve to death and go extinct, or it can begin to experiment with uh, new foods. The reason most animals don't ordinarily experiment with foods is because that kind of experimentation leads to exposure to mutagenic chemicals, and that creates mutation, which is generally lethal. Faced with extinction and starvation, we began to experiment with the new vegetables that we encountered in the grasslands of Africa. And in that same grassland environment, ungulate mammals, uh, bison, primitive cattle, so forth and so on, were also evolving. And the dung of those animals is the preferred environment for certain species of mushrooms that elaborate psilocybin. I maintain psilocybin is the missing key to understanding human emergence. The missing link is not a transitional skeleton. The missing link is an environmental factor of some sort. And here's how I think it worked. Psilocybin in small doses uh, increases visual acuity. This has been shown in laboratory situations with graduate students and other test animals. <laughs> Visual acuity is improved with small doses of psilocybin. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that an improvement in visual acuity would have a tremendous impact on a hunting gathering animal in a situation of nutritional stress. It means more successful hunting. It means more nutrition and protein available for offspring. It means raising one's offspring to reproductive age with greater success than other members of the group that are not using psilocybin. So there is the, the thin wedge in that psilocybin, un, perhaps unconsciously integrated into the diet, gives a slightly increased success at food acquisition. At higher doses, psilocybin creates what's called, and all CNS stimulants, create what's called arousal. This means this is how you feel after you have two double cappuccinos, you know, pacing around, scanning the environment. And in highly sexed animals like primates, in the male it means erection. So it becomes then a, a promoter of increased sexual activity, what primatologists like to call more successful instances of copulation. Mm -hmm. That's a second factor tending to outbreed members of the group not using psilocybin. Then, at still higher levels, hunting is out of the question. <laughs> out of the question and you're just nailed to the ground by the firelight writhing in the ecstasis of hallucinogenic visions that unfolds around you a, a, a situation that to us with all our sophistication Husserl, Heidegger, Michael Jackson the whole thing we are as in awe of that as those proto-human beings must have been so there it is it's a three-stage process better success at hunting, greater expression of sexuality and outbreeding of non-psilocybin using members of the population, and then dissolution of boundaries into ecstasy. And this is the important one because, because the thing that distinguishes our civilization and our lifestyle and our telos is ego. We believe that the free 
democratic individual is the highest expression of human evolution on this planet. We have deified the ego. But notice that the ego is one, fragile, and two, it exists by definition of boundaries. My house, my job, my lover, my fortune, your house, your lover, your fortune. Ego means we define boundaries, the very thing that the psychedelics erode. And I believe that the, the sexual arousal and the boundary dissolution, when poured together in a social context in the high Paleolithic, created a society based on orgiastic sex and incredibly tight community values. Because one of the consequences of an orgiastic style is men cannot trace lines of male paternity. Therefore, men do not have children in the ordinary sense. Children belong to the group. And loyalty, then, is transferred to the group. It is not transferred to the family unit. And there was a moment 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 100,000 years, a window when on the plains of Africa, under the influence of psilocybin and a non-hierarchical, orgiastic, nomadic society, we created poetry, drama, philosophy, higher values, altruism, courage, self-sacrifice, all of the values that we call human and transcendental were created in that environment. And then, and then, uh, no more than 15 to 20,000 years ago, the very forces which created that partnership paradise destroyed it. And what were those forces? Nothing more than the continued drying of the African continent. And the mushrooms began to disappear, began to become seasonal, began to be located only in the rain shadows of mountains. And when the availability of psilocybin began to decline, the old primate programming which had never been removed from the animal, re-emerged. The formation of dominance hierarchies re-emerged. It must have been an awful, awful time. I mean, if many, many generations could be compressed into one, it would have been a time where people would have said, we don't seem to love each other anymore. We seem to have no spirit of community. We seem to have become competitive. We're now struggling over land and food and women and social position. Uh, a brutalizing of life occurred at that critical juncture when agriculture was invented as a response to further drying, when the huge database about nature that the hunter-gatherers had created was dumped in favor of the very limited database of the monocultural agriculturalists and male hierarchy, male dominance, kingship, wall cities, an end to nomadism, uh, slavery, all of these institutions emerged in roughly a thousand to fifteen hundred years in the Middle East and across North Africa and that is the sad set of circumstances of which we are the heirs, many generations removed. So we are like dysfunctional children. Something terrible happened to us in the childhood of our intelligence. We lost our connection to the Gaian matrix, to the goddess mother of the earth who gives coherency to life. And when the connection was lost, we fell into history. It was a perverse thing. People became frantic to preserve the mushrooms, and they created strategies such as pickling them in honey. 
The problem with that is honey itself can change into a psychoactive compound, fermented alcohol. This creates a completely different set of cultural values. Alcohol promotes uh, an inflated sense of verbal facility at the same time that it lowers boundaries to social cueing. Go to any singles bar on a Friday night and you will see this in action. It, pre it promotes a further brutalization of culture. So this, to my mind, explains our obsession with substances. Why it is that we addict and addict and addict it's because we are looking for something. Just like a kitten that will suck on your armpit or your gloves because it was weaned too early, we're willing to try anything to try and get a certain satisfaction. So, you know, heroin, hang gliding, ketamine, you name it, it's all out there. Marxism, sexism, sadomasochism, whatever. None of it will satisfy because none of it is the original thing that we're looking for. The original thing we are looking for, I think, is the, the state of mind induced by Yundo hallucinogen, specifically psilocybin. And we need to have a cultural dialogue about this. There is no other point of view. In other words, nobody has a good story about how we got here, how, how we emerged out of human uh, prototypes so quickly. It must have been a dietary factor. It must have been a dietary factor that put extraordinary pressure on the neuro-linguistic systems of the evolving human brain. Psilocybin fits the profile. It was available in that environment at the right time, in the right quantity. And I maintain, you know, we're not simply solving here a kind of abstract question about human origins. We are also pointing the way toward answers. Because until we return to these archaic folkways, shamanism, hallucinogenic intoxication, honoring of the feminine, dissolution of boundaries, uh, so forth, uh, re-tribalizing of social relations, so forth and so on, we are going to continue to drift toward extinction. So it's time to start speaking about the unspeakable. It's time to articulate these options. It's possible that we're going to sink into the quicksand of extinction with the answer clutched in our hand. That would be a tragedy too much to bear. I mean, it's one thing to think there are no answers. It's quite another to die with the answer in your hand. I mean, that's just sheer shit brain stupidity. So what must be done is the psychedelic meme must be given respectability. It must be outed. It must be surfaced. People of intelligence whose lives have been touched by these things have to begin to witness it. This is how gay people got respect. It's how people of color got respect. They're, they're not handing rights out in this society, in case you didn't notice. The only way you are given your rights is if you demand them. And the idea that plants should be illegal and that the evolution and exploration of one's own mind should be of interest and uh, regulated by the state is obscene. Absurd. <laughs> and intolerable. So, here we are. Nine times in the last hundred thousand years, the ice has moved outward from the poles, destroying everything in its path. Our people crossed the Straits of Beringia thousands and thousands of years ago. They didn't have antibiotics, they didn't have MTV, they didn't have central air conditioning, but they managed to get us to this point. Now the ball is in our hands. We have global databases, we have uh, uh, the internet, we have systems of communication and data gathering undreamed of even 10 or 15 years ago. If we drop the ball, all of nature witnesses 
are failure and our unborn children are the recipients of the consequences of that catastrophe. So I think it's time to uh, begin to talk very, very frankly about the forced engineering of consciousness, about the re-shamanizing of society, about the rebirth of archaic values uh, before it's too late. If we do this, I really believe that we primates love a good scrap and that it's not too late. It's just almost too late. We are like someone awakening in a stupor in a burning house. It's time to stagger out onto the front lawn and sort things out or we're going to be crispy critters if we don't get our act together. So I want to urge each of you to consider yourself uh, self-selected to be here tonight and therefore potentially an ambassador for reason on this issue of consciousness expansion and self-exploration. Uh, this is how religion was practiced for the first million years of its existence. It was only later that men wearing dresses took over the operation and have been shoving it down everybody's throat in a very unpleasant form ever since. The Gaia matrix is there. Psychedelics work. We're not talking about sweeping up around the ashram for 12 years before somebody gives you the good. This stuff works. I mean, if you had taken five dry grams tonight in the confines of your home, instead of coming here, uh, you would be there now. So it is a tool which works. It doesn't, uh, it isn't controlled by any BDI faction uh, with a bunch of mumbo jumbo around it. It is self-directed, self-explanatory, and uh, anyone who loves adventure and who loves life and who loves the experience of being has an obligation, I think, to explore this. It's as much a part of your identity as your sexuality, your ancestral history, or your hopes and fears. And to ignore it is to choose to play with less than a full deck. Don't do that. Play with a full deck. Help launch the millennium. Let's save the planet and create a world that we can be proud to hand on to our children. Thank you very much. We'll take about a 15 minute break. I think they're dealing books and things in the back. And then we'll do Q&A from the audience, which is much more fun, I assure you. Thank you very much for coming out. if you could come up to the microphone and those who have additional questions if you could sort of queue up behind and uh, yeah. then Terence will answer them. Okay. And the first question is... What happened to the dinosaurs? Oh, what happened to the dinosaurs? An easy question. <laughs> There's argument about everything, but I think it's fairly clear that the dinosaurs were pushed into extinction by a cometary impact on the Earth. This is an inch, I mean, I don't know what lay behind your question, but I'm very interested in these kind of cometary impacts because they uh, create very sudden extinctions and uh, those of you who attend the workshop and some of the rest of you may know I have a theory about time that is mathematical and predictive and one of the uh, if you're going to predict uh, the past anyway one of the things your theory has to kick out is this extinction of the dinosaurs 
and it now appears fairly clear that an object struck the earth and broke into two pieces if not more and impacted essentially in the Gulf of Mexico and in a single day they went extinct. Some of you may know, I mean this is not simply something which lies in the distant past, uh, this July, July of this year, an object of similar size will impact on Jupiter. This object called Schumacher Levy 9, which has broken into 25 fragments of about 2 to 5 kilometers each, is going to smash down on Jupiter uh, the week of July 21st. Those of you who follow these things on the time wave will see it there at the bottom of the novelty trough, uh, lending yet further credence to the idea. Yes. <laughs> You're it. Um, I found some mushrooms the other day. Uh, <laughs> I never found mushrooms before, but I'm pretty darn sure these are psilocybin mushrooms. Um, do you know anything about drying them? I, I, I dried them in my tent, and uh, after about two days, they weren't dry. Did they turn to slime? No, 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 no. Um, they were almost all the way dry, but I didn't think they'd be dry enough to put into a plastic bag, and I sort of wanted to wait until the full moon. I did a few of them, actually. And were they the real yes, yes, that they, they bought? Yeah, the, the spore print and the bruising and the taste and the smell, everything, everything is there, it came right off the ground. <laughs> I, never, I never picked them up, like I said, but I'm pretty sure these are there. Well, do you know anything about, will they go bad if I put them in the sun for a couple of hours? <laughs> I already did that and it dried up real quick, you know. Well, the key to keeping them is to dry them very, very well. I mean, uh -huh. they shouldn't be rubbery at all. They should be as crisp as a crisp saltine cracker. So they aren't bad then? No, no, they're not bad. And then what you do is you put them in a, you know these, I don't want to, I should get money for this, but <laughs> a daisy seal meal system <laughs> where you can suck the air out of the bag so that there's no air in it and so that the bag seals down very tightly around the mushrooms. If you use that system and then put them in the back of a dark freezer, they'll last virtually forever. What degrades psilocybin is light and moisture. And so you've got to get light and moisture out of the picture, and then it will last for a really long time. If you have a lot of mushrooms that you're trying to preserve, it also helps to powder them, and then pound them, like with a dowel and a hammer, pound them into a container so that it's really dense, so that they're tightly packed, airless and cold and without light. And then it's good for your lifetime. <laughs> sure. Hi, I just wanted to know if you have heard about a book called The Mutant Message? No. Okay, I, I want to tell you a little bit about it because it's very interesting. I think it follows what you're talking about. Um, I love your idea of a collective consciousness. And I think um, the book describes an uh, aboriginal tribe in Australia that has been living out the, the way in which you're speaking, a collective. And what they've come to the conclusion of is that they can no longer procreate because they have recognized that um, they can no longer exist on this planet. And the reason they call the book the mutant message is that they believe we are a mutant life form on this planet that is destroying it uh, to the extent that they can no longer continue their lineage. And this is an interesting concept because it's the first culture I know that has selectively chosen not to breed. And uh, along with your concept of raising our consciousness so that we understand the destructive nature of ourselves, what about a parallel vision of reducing our population as these people are, of, of consciously choosing not to procreate at this time? <laughs> Well, it's interesting that you brought this up. Yes, I've been saying for some time that, and the mushroom pointed this out to me, if every woman had only one child, 
the population of the planet would fall 50% in 40 years. 50% in 40 years without war, revolution, coercion, anything else. And now when you suggest this to people, they say, well, didn't they try that in China and it failed? Yes, but you have to think about a couple of things. First of all, a, a child born to a woman in Maui or Malibu or Manhattan, that child will use between 800 and 1,000 times more resources in its lifetime than a child born to a woman in Bangladesh. Why do we preach birth control in Bangladesh? We should be preaching it on Maui, Manhattan, and Malibu because the women in those places are highly educated, socially responsible, global people and therefore are the population most likely to respond to this suggestion. If 15% of the women in the high-tech industrial democracies were to limit their childbearing uh, to one child, within 10 years, certain pressure indicators on the planet would begin to move away from the red and into the black. So I think that we have got to deal with this question of population. There are clearly too many people. And one woman, one child, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist or a psychedelic advocate to understand the impact of that. If the population of the Earth were cut in half, everybody alive would be twice as wealthy. It's possible in 120 years that we could reduce the Earth's population to a billion very healthy, very comfortable, very well-educated people. Okay, that's part of what the mushroom said, and I think it may seem radical in some circles, but not here, perhaps. It also said something else, which I rarely mention, but since you brought it up, there are not only too many people, there are too many men. And I would be very interested in seeing a set of social policies, tax incentives, medical policies, insurance policies put in place to limit male birth. It's very rare in mammal populations that you have a 50-50 ratio of male to female. And in fact, it's well known that male infants are less robust than female infants. And the reason we have a 50-50 sexual ratio is because we artificially support males and withdraw resources from females. I suspect that in the high Paleolithic, the ratio was closer to uh, two to one. And my supposition in thinking about this is probably that the best ratio is about three to one. Uh, this is the way to feminize the human race if you're serious. This is the way to advance women if you're serious. Then what you have is less men, women whose uh, dedication to the reproductive activities is confined in time to the amount of time it takes to raise only one child. This would be tremendously uh, solitary to our problems. I've never heard it advocated, even by the most radical lesbian feminist yada yada. I've never heard anyone say male birth should be limited, but it obviously should, and through an amniocentesis and this sort of thing, we can steer ourselves toward a population with the predominance of females, and those females should have only one child, and 75% of those children should also be female. This would seem, and I don't consider myself a gung-ho feminist. I mean, I'm, I'm a feminist, but I don't read the literature or try to understand all the factions and theories. As a humanist, I advocate a reduction in male births. It just seems obvious that that's uh, the way to go. If it doesn't seem obvious to you, then let's have a public debate about it and at least make it part of the rhetoric of the culture that this is an option for people to think about. I, I 
I'd like to just add one thing. I was listening to the uh, President's Council on Sustainable Development. It's very interesting when you bring up the population issue because certain social groups that feel they are not being heard because their numbers are not large enough feel that's their only trump card at this point. And um, that's real frightening, but I understand the need for social justice and that feels like their only alternative is to populate in order to get um, the respect that they need. So. But, but that argument, if that argument were true, that, pop, that numbers were political power, then China would be the most powerful nation on the planet. I, I don't see that. I think it's a, a, a false analysis. I think that the quality of life of your citizenry dictates your position in the hierarchy of, of global societies. It's a crazy argument to say that the for instance, the Hawaiians can only gain political power through breeding themselves into ever larger numbers. I mean, how practical is that? But people cannot afford large families. It's a prescription for further poverty, further overcrowding, and further neuro neurotic family situations. The child, the, op the objection I hear to the one woman, one child idea is that only children are neurotic. But I don't believe this. I think the uh, post-industrial nuclear family model is extraordinarily neurotic because the parents model neurosis for the two children who are usually part of the picture. The nuclear family is a product of the Industrial Revolution. It is not a traditional social unit rooted in thousands of years of, of human uh, uh, experimentation. It's entirely a social unit can, uh, created for the convenience of the factory and the office. If we are gung-ho to return to archaic social units, then we have to return to the extended family. And of course that's very difficult because modern transportation makes it possible for families to exist, to spread out all over the world. But, you know, whether you're psychedelic or not, it's perfectly clear that if population is not somehow controlled, all other good works, all other liberal forward-thinking policies will come to nothing because the burgeoning population simply uh, sucks up the resources uh, that are free. So, and yes, we have to then take on the Catholic Church and so forth and so on, but no group of people should be free to run around advocating policies that threaten the survival of the human race. I mean, that should be, if there are ideological crimes, that should be one of them. And the idea that you can run around advocating policies that wreck the land and push millions of people into poverty, degradation, and death is obscene. I mean, people didn't, uh, people didn't care for the Holocaust. That was a moral outrage. But the policies of the Roman Catholic Church push more people into early death, disease, and poverty than the Holocaust ever did. And yet, you know, they're perfectly free to run their bingo games and appear among us. Why? They should have to answer for this outrage. Of course, I have to tell you, I'm a recovering Catholic, so... <laughs> Terence, you've, uh, you're advocating psilocybin here as uh, a possible key towards the necessary transformation in consciousness that we need, uh, you know, for this culture, this uh, current civilization to continue. And uh, you painted a wonderful picture about how we really are at kind of a break point. I mean, something has to happen. But I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any kind of scenario to envision any way in which? Uh, it's possible for the widespread ingestion and usage of this stuff. I mean, it's currently criminal. Uh, it's, um, how can this work? How can it happen? I mean, it's something that you have to take, right? You have to have the experience, and you're saying that a large number of people have to have it. Well, 
There are different answers that range from obvious to inobvious. I mean, you're all probably up to speed on the legalization struggle, how hopeless it seems, how prolonged the, the debate. Recently, I've been thinking about this in a slightly different way. Here's an idea. <laughs> there is a plant called Salvia divinorum. Probably most of you have never heard of it. It contains a compound which is not an indole and which is not scheduled called salvorine alpha. When you take 20 leaves of this plant, which can be grown in most climates and everywhere in the world as a house plant very easily, when you take 20 leaves of this plant and chew it up and lie down in silent darkness, it provokes about 40 minutes of extraordinarily highly colored three-dimensional hallucinations. Let's keep salvia legal. Salvia is legal. There are no laws against it anywhere on this planet. There are no laws against this substance anywhere on this planet. Keep salvia divinorum legal and go home and plant it and grow it and take it and you will not be disappointed. I am, uh, this is not a shock. In other words, I test everything anybody tells me works and it never does. This works and in fact chemists in the past six months have isolated the compound. It's called salborine alpha. It's an isoquinoline. It's uh, absolutely unknown to uh, law enforcement. It has no history of human abuse. And it's active in the 200 microgram range. And it's smokable. Salvia divinorum should be kept legal. It should be propagated everywhere. It should be widely grown and taken. Psychotherapists can use it. You can organize your church around it. You can do whatever you want with it. If what we're trying to do is get the psychedelic experience into the public domain, this is the way to go. Once we secure that salvia does not cause madness, <laughs> impotence, whatever, then uh, the, the issue of these other psychedelics will be seen in a different perspective. This, by the way, is very new information. And there are people who will shit a brick when they find out I said this to you tonight. Because there's a debate going on in the upper echelons of psychedelia about whether or not this should be public knowledge. I trust that debate is now closed. <laughs> Of, of psychoactive gardening. Pardon me? Spell it. Ah, salvia, S A L V I A. Space, D I V I N O R U M. Salvia divinorum, called in Mexico, Ojos de la Pastora, the eyes of the shepherdess. Go figure. <clears throat> yeah. I had an opportunity before I arrived here to speak with Brenda Laurel, who is the self-proclaimed VR goddess. Um, she believes that we need to wrestle control of technology from the scientist to the artist. Um, could you extrapolate on that and your views on virtual reality? Yes, well, I've wrestled Brenda a number of times. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I'm very excited about virtual reality, which some people think is a funny thing for a botanist and a jungle bunny to be into. But what I see coming out of VR is a technology by which we can show each other the inside of our own heads. That's what it promises. I can imagine a world where around age six or seven, a child begins to build their virtual reality. 
Well, by the time you're 25, it would be half the size of Manhattan, and it would be your world, and it would be more you than your body. I mean, after all, we don't really identify, do we, with 145 pounds of monkey flesh. That is not you. You are your hopes, your fears, your dreams, the inner soul, the poetry. So I can imagine a world where if you were seriously interested in having a relationship with someone, you would invite them into your reality and say, this is me. Stroll around, check the levels, visit the museum and the spa, and see what you think. Um, naturally, virtual reality will be, is potentially trivializable. Millions of people right now are being warehoused by television. I mean, television is the heroine of the electrified middle class. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure it's a bad thing. I mean, how would you like all those people out driving around and shopping and getting in your way? It's good that they're off in their condominiums watching whatever they're watching. I'm not an anti-technologist. In fact, quite the contrary. I think technology is a fascinating extension of ourselves. And I think, you know, we're taking hold of the human image. We're beginning to dream the dream of becoming whatever we want to become. And we don't, it's very difficult because we're emerging from the umbrella of Christian theology that told us that human nature was sinful, blemished, fallen from its true state. And yet, you know, we really have to return to the point of view of the great Renaissance magicians like Marcello Ficino, who said, he said, man, but let us say humanity is the measure of all things. Humanity is the measure of all things. We are the caretakers of the earth. That's not something we can choose. It's already a done deal. The earth is now our responsibility. And it's through technology that we dissolve some of our boundaries and knit ourselves into a community of global management and caring. I think that's very uh, important. I think technology has been obscenely in the service of profit. And science, too, has hoarded itself to profit. But what kind of world could be built if these things were in the service of art? It's our cultural values that are out of whack. There's no reason to go, uh, you know, beating on science or technology. It's the monkey manipulating and applying these things that needs to be thoroughly looked at and possibly pharmacologically rewired. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I've uh, read a lot of your stuff about DMT and so I just want to know what the difference between DMT and mushrooms are when they're intoxicated, because I've never been intoxicated with DMT. Uh -huh. Well, that's all. Psilocybin and DMT are extraordinary structural near relatives. However, in the process of being metabolized in the body, psilocybin never becomes DMT. It, it passes close to it. DMT is, to my mind, um, the, the substance where all of these issues are brought to a white-hot nexus of intensity because DMT is very brief. It lasts on the order of 500 seconds, you know, under three, under five minutes for most people. You return to the baseline of consciousness. It's a human neurotransmitter. It occurs in many, many plants. It is the strongest of all naturally occurring hallucinogens. And looking at the uh, physiological profile, it is probably the safest of all natural hallucinogens. And that's an incredible challenge to everyone in this room. You know, the strongest, and the safest spun into one. So there's no excuse not to do it, you see. It's also, because of its extraordinary brevity, uh, a, a 
an incredible challenge to those who want to criticize psychedelics. I mean, it's ridiculous to criticize a drug you haven't taken. I mean, it's sheer, boneheaded, know-nothingism. So I can respond to the argument of my critics that they can have a lifetime of criticizing psychedelic drugs, but they can't spend eight hours to take mushrooms, but surely they can spend 10 minutes to smoke DMT. Well, once you smoke DMT, uh, I believe we have you. Uh, <laughs> there is no going back, because it is such an extraordinary revelation not of any, any theogony of white lights or any Jungian or Freudian map of the unconscious, but rather the revelation of something utterly unexpected, overwhelmingly strange, definitely translinguistic, and repeatable on demand. You know, we're not talking about standing in cornfields here and praying for flying saucers. Uh, uh, DMT is a reliable method for crossing in to a dimension that human beings have debated the existence of for 50,000 years. Is there an invisible nearby world inhabited by active intelligences with which human beings can communicate? You bet your booties there is. And, you know, if you don't think so, then tell me you don't think so and you've smoked 70 milligrams of DMT. Otherwise, we just don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> yes, yes. I love your theory um, of the missing link and psilocybin being a possible solution to the missing link there. Um, and I think of how different we are as a culture now from what the people who lived then would have been, who were connected to the earth and not breathing smog and didn't have their nervous systems blocked by the million stressors that we have in our day-to-day -day life now. And one of the things that concerns me as a long-time observer of psychedelics on people, not so much psilocybin specifically, but LSD and, and more chemically altered ones, um, and watching the way that that does sometimes affect different people different ways, and sometimes in a not always positive way. And when I hear people talking about using psychedelics as a general solution to something, a lot of alarms go off in me because I've seen so much temporary and sometimes long-term suffering from it. And I don't know, I'd like to look at that side of it. Yeah, well, I agree. I mean, I, I think that the problem is not with the psychedelics. The problem is with educating people. I mean, the way I do psychedelics is fairly infrequently and at quite high doses and in darkness. And then this is my preference, but alone. And the way not to do psychedelics is frequently and at low doses and in socially dense and complex situations uh, because it draws energy from the thing. There are a lot of people running around who think they have their psychedelic credentials in order, who have in fact only tickled the tummy of the beast. Uh, you know, there are social subclasses where you get a lot of respect if you say you're a psychedelic head, and a lot of people simply want entry into the social club. So they say, oh yeah, acid, I took a lot of acid in my time and this and that. But the question is not how much you took, the question is how much you took any given time. Because when I talk about the psychedelic experience, there are thousands of altered states uh, you know, yoga, hyperventilation, toxicity, dreams, uh, uppers, downers, juice. There are all kinds of altered states. The psychedelic state is 
very, very defined in my mind. Uh, it's characterized by boundary dissolution, by visual hallucination. That's important. The people who say they've taken these things and never hallucinated have to go back for a retread. It doesn't count if you don't hallucinate. They're hallucinogens, remember? So uh, it, it's, a, it's a very specific thing that they do. I don't even care for the disassociative uh, anesthetics like ketamine. I don't care for opium. I don't care for cocaine. I mean, I've done all these things, but they're not interesting. What's interesting is the transformation of, of, uh, of psyche, which goes on in the presence of these indoles. And we have to educate our children in the schools. We have to teach them about shamanism. We have to teach them about risk. Uh, you mentioned the casualties along the way. There are people among us for whom boundary dissolution is not the problem. Their boundaries are dissolving all the time. And they are not good candidates for psychedelics. Uh, they are uh, fragile, made fragile by the same set of traumatic uh, uh, forces that may have made you not fragile. But as a general rule, if you have psychic health, psychedelics are not going to um, harm you. And I've always felt that, uh, that people know whether they're at risk from these things. Uh, I always believe Tim Leary made this statement, but when I tried to give him credit for it, he expressed amazement and said he never said such a thing. But somebody once said, LSD is a substance which occasionally causes psychotic behavior in people who have not taken it. And I certainly found that to be true. Uh, it caused members of my family to become psychotic who had not taken it. And I'll bet you that if we could look at the number of emergency room admissions caused by LSD, most of them are caused, were people who didn't take it, but who had a coronary thrombosis when their child told them they were taking it, something like that. So uh, we have to educate our children. We cannot we have no shamanic tradition. We don't initiate our children into sex or anything else. We need to create a neo-shamanic institution. And I see modern psychotherapy as a, a, a kind of incipient shamanism that could educate people. But as long as we tolerate uh, the propagation of media lies, disinformation, hysteria, then we're going to have casualties. And, and there are also, you know, unstable personalities who simply do not follow the directions. Everything has directions. Whether you're, you know, ironing your clothes, tuning up your car, or taking psychedelics. If you don't follow the directions, whose responsibility is it if you screw up? So we have to educate our children, educate ourselves, get these things out of the closet, and make them part of the culture. That's the way to deal with sexuality. That's the way to deal uh, with drugs, maturely. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I agree that education is um, one of the major importance of, of uh, being able to understand what we're doing to our minds and to our body. Um, and what you were talking about with Timothy Leary, I remember reading one of his books that he, he said that uh, unless you leave your system in 20 minutes or with your first um, urinary... Urinary, urinary. <laughs> your first pee. <laughs> okay, and so that leads me to believe that it's completely your mind that, um, that helps understand what's going on within you and not actually the drug itself, which it helps open up doors, but then it's your own mind that keeps doors open. Well, 
I think that's true to a degree. I was thinking about this last night for some reason. It has to do with what you bring to it. And, you know, we all have an obligation to be experienced. And by that I mean, uh, you know, if you've always lived in a small town south of Hudson Bay and you never learn to read and you don't watch TV, you don't bring much to the psychedelic experience. I am filled with a ravenous curiosity for everything. Uh, uh, unexplored countries, ancient languages, forgotten cultures, uh, abandoned philosophical systems, uh, the detritus of the human experience through time. I love all that stuff. I read constantly. Other, and consequently, I have a lot of data for the thing to manipulate. It can only communicate with you in words that you already possess. So uh, the psychedelic experience is most dramatic for people who have had a lot of other experiences, I think, because they bring something to it. I was just going to say that with my own experiences, I've been able to um, counteract any bad vibes, I guess, that were coming my way through the will of knowing that it's out of my system and it's merely my mind. And um, helping people go through, whether it be a bad trip or not, may seem that it's your mind that's it. Um, I don't know if that's making any sense, but that uh, knowing that it's not the drug and that it's your mind that's doing the evolving, that you have the capability of stopping at any time and going to sleep and waking up the next morning and continuing your life. Yeah, well, I don't want to knock the prop out from under you, but I don't know how secure this data is that LSD leaves your body in 20 minutes. Uh, I'd be interested to see the papers that secure that. It is your mind, but what is mind? You know, philosophers have been at this for thousands of years. Nobody has a clue, not a clue. What is mind? Uh, is, it, is it the electrochemical activity of the brain? Is it where in the body does it originate? You know, with all the fancy instruments of modern medicine, no one has ever seen a thought form in brain tissue. No one has ever been able to make a direct analogy between an EEG tracing and a thought. Thought is still very, very mysterious. Uh, when I think that I will close my hand into a fist, that's a miracle. That's mind over matter. No philosopher in human history has ever been able to explain how that simple act takes place. That tells you that philosophy has been staying well away from the world of direct experience because every day we experience willing our body to act and yet we say mind cannot affect matter. Well, why do we have this contradiction? It's because we don't want to admit the primacy of mind. Do you want to say something else? Okay. You? Yeah, go for it. I have a thought. Um, I found mushrooms too the other day, actually. And a very special place on the island. And unfortunately, they didn't turn to mush because I was doing a, a new experiment with them that didn't quite work. Um, I wanted to know if you felt that there was any medicinal properties to psilocybin. Um, I personally had uh, stomach problems for the last couple of days. And after Taking a few of the mushrooms um, completely relieved any problems that I have as far as a genetic or a tonic. So uh, it's your mind, yeah. <laughs> but but let me say something about this question because it came up twice. The the reason I asked the question, did it turn to slime of the mushroom, is because there are two kinds of mushrooms. Uh, I mean, there are many kinds, but two categories of mushrooms. There, some mushrooms do what is called auto-digest. This is where when you pick them a few hours later, they release a lysolytic enzyme in the cells and they turn to slime. 
And the two kinds of mushrooms that are most common in the Hawaiian Islands are Coprinus and, uh, and uh, uh, Paniolus. Both grow in dung, both blue, and both turn to slime. And both contain uh, chemicals not related to psilocybin, which could kick up your stomach a little. So uh, there are other mushrooms much rarer out here which don't auto-digest and which have a purer signature for psilocybin. One of the things that's always puzzled me about Hawaii is why there aren't more mushroom growers out here. And it's because when you grow mushrooms here and then you try to sell them, you're met with the argument, why should I buy your mushrooms when I can pick them in the pastures? The answer is because these are different mushrooms and much superior to what you can get in the pastures. So there's more to it than just psilocybin mushrooms. You want to get psilocybin mushrooms in a vegetable matrix free from any other physiologically active compound. Yeah. This will maybe be the last. <laughs> the um, psychedelic experience and cannabis experience certainly for me has helped me open to wisdom of nature that comes from being in a completely divine uh, atmosphere and allowing wisdom to come. And that is true of so many of my, particularly women friends, but men who have balanced their yin experience. And there certainly are, we are everywhere in every culture that I've traveled in. And we are opening to the shamanic experience in white people. And um, so how do you recommend and how do you see the Gaian information, the mind, uh, joining and supporting each other and ourselves to the next level? Well, it's basically, as I said, people have to come out of the closet and people have to act from their convictions. I mean, I think one of the most disturbing things that can go on is where you go to visit some people and they say, um, we can't smoke till the children go to bed. This is nuts. This means that this is a house divided against itself and it can't possibly stand. If you don't have the guts to tell your children you smoke dope, then you shouldn't smoke dope for crying out loud. We have to come out of the closet. And I know, you know, it's not easy. People are teachers, people are this, people are that. But on the other hand, what what's the payback for being chicken shipped. The payback is continued repression, continued manipulation. If you don't claim the right to be able to explore your own mind, then all other rights are potentially to be taken from you. And I think, you know, there are all kinds of stories going around. Potheads can't think straight. People who use drugs don't bathe enough, so forth and so on. This is, this is a kind of ism. It's not sexism, it's not racism, it's dopeism. And, you know, enough of that. Uh, we pay our taxes, we hold down top jobs in advertising, publishing, media, entertainment, science, compass, software writing, so forth and so on. And we should have the same respect that is due everybody else in this society. The people who are repressing dope culture have no agenda. They have no plan. Their plan is to keep everybody in a state of semi-anesthesia until the shit hits the fan. That's the only thing they can figure out to do. Because they don't know how to feed everybody. They don't know how to cure AIDS. They don't know how to de- uh, populate these enormous cities. They don't know how to generate enough electricity for the evolving population. They have no answers. All they have are spin doctors and cosmetics and uh, delay and uh, disinformation. So I, I do not understand the passivity of people on these issues. The world is slipping through our fingers because we don't 
have the courage to stand up and halt it. And if we don't have the courage to stand up and halt it, we are voting with the dominators. We are voting with those processes that will make us extinct. These governments, these institutions exist to serve us. It's no big deal to throw down an institution. It's not even a big deal to hang a few dominators. Why are we so polite? Why are we so willing to go along with this shell game? Uh, it's only the entire future of the planet that's at stake. So do we want to be like the Jews in Europe who went quietly to the trains to be taken to the camps? That's the spectacle that I fear. I think we just have to say this dope thing is the biggest shock in history. I mean, governments have always made money off dope. And whenever any particular drug became too odious for them to continue their practice, then they handed it on to some mafia and took their cut in kickbacks. And that's what's happening now. Meanwhile, psychedelics, which unite people, dissolve barriers, make us one with each other, and have never made a lot of money for anybody compared to the real drugs of commerce, heroin, and cocaine and that sort of thing, uh, these drugs are stigmatized and suppressed and we commit our individual acts of civil disobedience in our fine homes with the front door locked, but we never can seem to reach out to each other sufficiently to create a community that says we've had enough, we're not going along with this anymore. That's how human freedom makes progress. The Magna Carta was signed when the Dukes of England told the king to stop it. And women got the vote when they demanded it. And black people got respect when they demanded it. And gays found a place in society when they demanded it. And when we insist, then the dialogue will begin and not until. So uh, I think the responsibility is on us. We can whine all we want about the helicopters overhead and the friends taken off to jail, but unless we're willing to stand up and be counted, uh, you know, why don't I have a hundred competitors? I'm making good money sitting up here talking to you. You too could have a life if you would advocate psychedelics from the stage. Well, I think we've beat this horse to death. I see that it's getting late. Uh, I hope that you'll come. If you aren't signed up for the workshop, I hope that you'll come. If you can't come, I, I appreciate your coming out. I hope you'll read my books, the books of my colleagues. There's a great deal of psychedelic publishing being done now. Uh, Sasha Shulgin's book, uh, Jonathan Knott's books, Eduardo Luna's books my books, uh, inform yourself. The first stop for a serious psychedelic voyager should be the public library. Inform your children, talk to your friends, and uh, let's try to make a better, stonier world out of the world we inherited. Thank you.